Friends, welcome to worship for Sunday, January 2nd, 2022, the second Sunday of Christmas. A new year lays before us. The next 12 months will be full of all kinds of things that bring us joy and heartache, that bring us tears full of gladness and sorrow, that bring us ups and downs and lots of in-betweens. What I know for certain is that the next 12 months will bring us the comfort, support, and encouragement of each other. The strength of our parish, united in our work together as Jesus' disciples, committed to following in his footsteps and to strengthening the ties that bind us together, sharing all of our lives with God and with each other. As we continue to live with COVID, I urge you to consider your vaccination status. The folks in our area hospitals who are in need of the most intensive medical care are almost entirely those who are not vaccinated. I know there has been a lot of information and misinformation about the vaccines, so please get reputable medical advice about what is best for your health and our collective health, remembering that we don't always get the vaccination for ourselves, but to keep others healthy and safe as well. For the moment, we seem to be avoiding the worst of the Omicron surge in our area, but the next several weeks will be the most telling as the effects of Christmas and New Year's gatherings are felt. We continue to gather in person for worship meetings and other things, but we urge caution and care to prevent the spread of COVID and all of the other viruses and illnesses that spread during this season. Please know that I and your parish leadership are regularly monitoring the situation in our area and doing our best to keep everyone connected and healthy. Please also be in touch if you have any concerns or suggestions about how we are handling the virus for our parish. As it is the first Sunday of the month, please take a moment before you begin worship to gather your communion elements near you, some bread and cup, and to remember that even scattered as we might be, we are part of the great communion of God's people, connected by God's incredible grace through this simple meal to Christians throughout time and around the world. Through all that life brings and into this new year of excitement and uncertainty, please remember Emmanuel. God with us isn't just something for Advent and Christmas that we box up with the ornaments when the season is over. It is God's commitment to being with us always and God's promise that we can depend on God and each other, this community of faith, to help us through whatever life brings. And now, I invite you to bring yourself to a spirit of worship. Let us pray. Arise, shine, for our light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Our spirits soar at the birth of the Holy One. Our hearts rejoice at the newness of God's grace. Arise, shine, for our light has come. The glory of the Lord is among us now. Our first hymn, Arise, Your Light Has Come, is one of my favorites. Regardless of the season of the church year, it invites us to celebrate God's presence in our lives, God's light that lives within us.
you go from this place, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you the grace never to say ourselves short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to know that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. And now let us pray together, remembering the Spirit is always with us. Holy God, light of all nations, shine on us today. Open us to your renewing spirit. Guide us that this time together might open our hearts, our minds, and our lives. Help us that we might be ambassadors of hope wherever we go. Inspire us that we might share the love of Jesus through our words and our actions. In faith we pray. Amen. And now we join our hearts and minds together in prayer, deepening and strengthening the ties that make us Christ's community, uniting ourselves with Christians throughout time and across the world. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come today in gratitude and thanksgiving for all of the blessings of our lives. We thank you for friends and family, for community and our parish, and all the ways you provide for and connect us one to another. We thank you for the gentle reminders in our lives that you are with us each and every day. Help us open our eyes to the miracles that surround us, the kindness, goodness, compassion, and hope that are present if we will only look at the world with your eyes. Guide and inspire us that we might see you in the presence of every person we meet, friends, family, strangers, those we believe are our enemies, and in our own faces. Help us remember and truly believe in our hearts and souls that there is no one you do not love. Remind us of the ties that bind us together as your people and your beloved creation. We give thanks for our congregations and our parish and all of the ways you bring us together to learn and grow as your people. Inspire us that we might walk more fully and faithfully in the path that Jesus showed us that we might widen the welcome and share your love with all we do and say. Be with those who stand in harm's way in our name, soldiers, sailors, firefighters, police officers, and first responders. Keep them safe as they do their work. Be with all the veterans and all who have served, and particularly with Kelsey Hoyman as she is deployed with the Air Force. Be with all those who provide for us, whose work is so often unseen and taken for granted. Be with those who provide what we need, the goods and services we depend on. With those who work to make sure we have food, shelter, utilities, social services, and more. Be with those who grow and pick our foods, work in shops and restaurants, who load and transport and deliver our goods. Be with those who maintain our communities, collect our garbage, and serve us in any way. Help us to be truly grateful for them and to share our gratitude more clearly. Help us be kind and compassionate and understand how truly difficult and essential their work is. Be with our medical professionals and facilities as they continue to struggle against COVID and uncertainty. Be with all who work in hospitals, clinics, nursing and care facilities and child care programs. Give them the strength and courage they need for these days. Help us to do our part to lessen their burdens, to keep ourselves and our communities healthy, and remind all who do this work that we are with them in prayer. Be with all who are in government on any level, those entrusted with the sacred work of leading our communities and the world. Inspire them to do what is just and what is right not just for us, but for all your children and for all creation. 
encourage and inspire our teachers and students, administrators and aides and all of their families. Give them all they need to learn and grow together that our communities might be strong. Help us to open our hearts to all those seeking places to live in safety and hope. Be with those who are resettling here in the United States as refugees from Afghanistan and Haiti and everywhere. Remind us that almost all of our ancestors came to this place as refugees and immigrants, and that your own son would be a refugee, fleeing to Egypt for safety in the early days of his life. Be with, O oh God, all who struggle in body, mind, and spirit, particularly those recovering from surgery and hospitalizations, all those dealing with the particular challenges of cancer and its treatments, those who are struggling with their mental health and the difficulties of receiving help, those who struggle with addiction, those who are living with COVID and its long-term effects, and all in need of your healing grace. Grant to all in need your healing, your grace, and your love, and remind all who struggle that we are with them. Be with all of us as we continue to struggle with this time in the life of the world. In all of the uncertainty of life, help us to trust that you are with us, that you are guiding and encouraging us, that you are giving us the courage and the strength we need for this moment and for all that is ahead. Comfort all who mourn and grieve, O God. Strengthen us if the loss is new or many years old and help us to trust in your promise through Jesus of life everlasting. Be with all the places in this world you love so very much that are dealing with natural disasters, fires, floods, and more, and all the places that are dealing with war, violence, and disease. Be with the people of Colorado dealing with such devastating fires, with Indonesia and other places recovering from devastating flooding, and all the places that need your help as they clean up and rebuild. Be with Afghanistan, Haiti, Tunisia, Myanmar, Syria, Tigray, the Sudan, the Congo, Palestine, Israel, and all the places where your people struggle for freedom and for peace. Be with the families of the missing and murdered indigenous women across the country, Help us as we learn about the reality of our shared history, particularly the history of slavery and residential schools. Help us listen and act that we might find a way forward, that we might create a world that honors the dignity of all people. Be with all who are victims of violence, sexism, racism, and all the interconnected isms that cause hatred and discrimination. Inspire us and give us hope that we might create a new way forward a path that recognizes you in all people and all creation. Help us to challenge all that causes us to be divided. Guide us that we might ask ourselves the questions and take the actions necessary to do our part to build up your kingdom of grace and abundance for all. Renew our hope, strengthen our faith, deepen our patience, and inspire our hearts, O God, give us the strength we need for whatever lies ahead. And together, in hope, we pray the words that Jesus would one day teach his first disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the prophet Isaiah and continues the reminder to the people that they will be restored, that God is with them, gathering them together and sustaining them, rebuilding them through God's own grace and love. Reading from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 5, adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. Arise. Shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, 
and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. All that They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. Our next hymn, as with gladness those of old, is set to the familiar tune of For the Beauty of the Earth. This hymn reminds us of the Magi following the star, bearing their gifts to the newborn Jesus, and prays that we might follow in the narrow way, even without a star in the sky, to guide us. reading is the familiar story of the Magi. First they come to King Herod and then they travel on to worship where the star tells them the newborn Jesus can be found. Our reading today however goes a little bit further and tells us of the dream that Joseph has and of the flight to Egypt with Mary and Jesus to keep them safe from Herod's rage. Reading from Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 15 adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, 
in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and worship him. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt, I have called my son. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the living of these scriptures. In the book of Genesis, Joseph, son of Jacob, has a gift, the gift of interpreting dreams. His older brothers, irritated with his flaunting of the gift, convinced that he's trying to take the inheritance that is rightly theirs, throw him into a pit, and then eventually sell him into slavery in Egypt. Only there, with the humility the experience of slavery must have brought him, does Joseph learn to use his skills at interpreting dreams more skillfully, more tactfully. He correctly interprets the Pharaoh's dreams, helping to save the people of Egypt and the surrounding countries, including his own family, the people of Israel, from the devastating effects of seven years of famine and drought. Fast forward several thousand years and we find ourselves in Matthew's gospel with another man named Joseph and another set of dreams that will utterly change the course of history. Joseph, the faithful carpenter from Nazareth who agrees to be the worldly father to God's own self, has two dreams. The first, of course, comes when he learns of Mary's pregnancy. He wonders what he should do. If he exposes Mary and tells the world about her pregnancy and says that the baby isn't his, then the world will think she has been unfaithful, broken her vows. She could have been kicked out of the community, shunned, or even worse, stoned to death for adultery. In his first dream, the angel Gabriel visits Joseph and reassures him, encourages him to take Mary as his wife and raise this incredible child as his own, naming him Jesus because he will turn the people's hearts and minds back to God. Today we hear of Joseph's second dream. The baby has been born. Surrounded by the muck and the animals of the barn on the edges of Bethlehem, choirs of angels have sung to him and about him. The lowly shepherds, fresh from the field, some of the least important people in the eyes of the world have come to worship him. The magi, sages of great wisdom from the east, have followed a star all the way across the world, bringing gifts to the newborn king to celebrate him as the prince of peace and the king of kings and the savior of the world. And now, Joseph has another dream. I imagine that all of his sleep in these days since they set out from Nazareth to Bethlehem had been restless, and maybe all of it filled with intense, intense and vivid dreams, but this one in particular rattles Joseph's heart and soul. He dreams, and the angel of the Lord once again speaks to him, telling him to get up, to waste no time and to take Mary and the baby and flee to Egypt to protect them from the wrath of King Herod. 
You see, the Magi had their own dream. Herod had tried to trick them into going to worship the newborn Jesus and then returning to him to tell this earthly king where he could find the baby who had been born king of the Jews. But the Magi weren't fooled. They knew that Herod didn't intend anything good, but to confirm their suspicions, they are warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, but to go back to their own country by a different route. When they do that, When they fail to return to Jerusalem, Herod is furious. He feels his power slipping away. Somewhere in Bethlehem there has been born another one, one who will rule over all people for all time, and Herod will no longer be king. His anger boils up, and he orders the death of all of the boys in Judea, in Bethlehem, under the age of two. That sweeping slaughter would have included the infant Jesus if Joseph hadn't been paying attention to his dream, hadn't been listening to what the angel of the Lord said to him, hadn't gotten up right that very minute, packed their things, loaded Mary and the baby on the donkey that had so faithfully carried them to Bethlehem and fled for their lives to safety in Egypt. Exactly. The shiny, happy, uplifting story we have come to associate with Christmas. But it's the reality of what happened when God came into the world, became human to teach us about how big God's love is for us, and the power of this world was afraid. When you bring love to the world, now, just as then, the world isn't sure what to do with it. We are so much more comfortable as humans with violence and division, with hatred and categories, sorting people into us and them. We're not sure what to do when someone comes with the purest motives and the biggest hearts with unconditional and overflowing love. Herod wasn't sure all those years ago, and we still aren't sure now. In our day, people who try to love with all of their hearts are labeled naive or idealistic foolish, soft, and more. But while the message of Bethlehem of that tiny baby in a barn is idealistic and gently soft, it isn't naive or foolish. It is the deepest truth we will ever know, that love is what's going to turn our hearts and minds and lives and world back to the path that God wants us on, the path that leads to wholeness and life for us and for all of creation. In a couple of weeks, we'll have put all the decorations away. The manger will be in a box for another 11 months or so. We'll get on with the important business of grown-up Jesus, of calling of disciples and teaching and preaching, the miracles and the death, and thankfully the resurrection. But I hope in our work to follow the grown-up Jesus, we don't put it all away. We don't lose sight of the manger of Bethlehem and the baby lying in that barn surrounded by the animals, worshipped by the shepherds and the magi, and fleeing in his mother and father's arms to Egypt, because that's where our faith truly begins, in God's decision, God's risk, risk to leave the glories of heaven and become human, to know our lives that we might know how great how big, how all-inclusive God's love really is. So let's hold in our hearts, not just during the Christmas season, but indeed every day of our lives, the miracle of Bethlehem. God became human for us and for all the world. And let us let that guide our every action, our every word, our every breath, that the kingdom of God's love might truly come. We come now to a time of confession, because we know that we need God's healing love to fill us and give us the courage to truly follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We come in humility and faith, trusting in God's grace that will receive us, forgive us, and offer us another chance to continue the work that Jesus began. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess to you and to ourselves what seems always with us, 
In our hearts and lives, there are broken places that never seem to mend and empty places that always seem to ache. Too often we forget your promises and your presence in our lives. We live in the illusion that we are in control of our lives. We ignore the pain of those around us and do not treat everyone with the compassion and kindness you desire from us. God of love, forgive us. Invite us back to you that we might turn our lives around. Help us to follow in the good and faithful path that Jesus showed us. Help us to depend on you and on one another. In hope and faith we pray. Amen. And now in a time of silence, we bring our own personal concerns to God's forgiving grace. Hear the good news. Emmanuel is here. God is born into our world to lead us to life and love. Receive God's forgiveness and mercy this day. Thanks be to God. And now I invite you to gather your communion elements near you. In response to God's incredible grace, the United Church of Christ and our parish practice open communion. Though we are separate from one another, we are united around God's table where we each proclaim that without exception, all are truly welcome and all receive God's goodness and grace. We come to this table to remember not just the last meal Jesus shared with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem, but to celebrate all of the meals Jesus shared during his lifetime. He ate with the powerful and the powerless at simple meals and elaborate feasts. He ate because he knew that something holy happens when we gather together at the table. We connect to one another and to the Holy One in ways that open us to all God wants for us and for creation. We come to the table freely to experience God's grace, to support those who are struggling that their difficulties might be lighter, to celebrate with those who are rejoicing that their joy might be multiplied, to walk with those who have questions as they seek a way forward, to sit with those who are lonely that they might feel our presence, and to stand with those who are oppressed that justice might truly come for all creation. We come to remind ourselves that this table and indeed all of our tables belong to God, who created and nurtured each of us in love. And today we celebrate that this table is spread by our community to welcome all in need of nurture and renewal, declaring that this table is open to everyone without exception. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for giving yourself to us in Jesus. We thank you that he lived among us and knew what it was like to be human. Feed us and renew us at this table. Give us the courage to be faithful to you, that we might follow more closely in Jesus' footsteps. Amen. We remember that one time Jesus had been teaching a great crowd of 5,000 people. The time came for them to eat, but all they had was five loaves of bread and two small fish. Jesus had the crowd sit down, blessed and broke the bread and fish, and had the disciples distribute it to the crowds. There was such an abundance at this meal that everyone ate until they were full, and yet there were 12 baskets of food left over. We remember that despite the complaints of some, Jesus ate with the tax collector Levi, an outcast in his own community because of his work with the Roman Empire. Jesus welcomed Levi and invited him to embrace new life. We remember that while Jesus was sharing a meal with some Pharisees, the religious and social leaders of his day, a woman, an outsider, came and anointed his feet with oil. Most at that table would have dismissed her, but Jesus celebrated her dignity and her faith. At these meals and at so many more, Jesus and those who followed him resisted the divisions, injustice, and violence of society. They lived out the dream of the kingdom of God, a place of love, justice, and abundance for all. And we remember that when all hope seemed lost, buried in the tomb, Jesus appeared to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, telling the story of our faith, breaking bread together, and sharing again in the mystery of communion. We pray, we pray, gracious God, that in the sharing of this bread and this cup today, we might remember all the tables of our lives in your presence at them. We pray we might embrace our part in the work that Jesus began. May your spirit fill us and nourish us in this moment, giving us the strength to serve you whatever the future holds. Bless this bread, 
given for life and love, and this cup given for mercy and hope, and bless us as we receive them, that we might be empowered and strengthened to share your love with all we meet. Come, come and know how good God is. Amen. Please partake of your communion elements now. And now, having shared in worship together, let us pray in thanksgiving for all God's blessings in our lives. Holy One, creator of all things, we give thanks for your gathering us together. We thank you for the inspiration of your word, for the presence of your spirit, and for your love which surrounds us through all our lives. As the Magi brought their gifts to the infant Jesus, we pray you would bless all that we bring, our gifts, our time, and our talents, and use them to nurture the love and peace our world so desperately needs. Inspire us that we might live out our faith, sharing your hope with all we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our last hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain, comes to us from the tradition of African American spirituals, inviting everyone to share the great good news of Jesus' birth. My friends, receive this benediction. May you know the miracle of Emmanuel, God always with us. And may God's great love, Jesus' presence, and the Spirit's guidance be with you today and always.